trying to see if you, some of you guys show up here. <laughs> Could be that the powers of be have zapped us. Oh, there's one per. Ooh, there you guys go. Four of you. Cool. Five of you. Just wait for maybe we'll get some double digits and we'll start. Alright. So, Chodoshtov, everybody. So, this, one, this one's going to be a little sentimental for me. Two nights ago, two evenings ago, Arab Shabbat. I um, I decide, hey, you know, I'm going to go to a Chabad for Kabbalah Shabbat. Mincha, Kabbalah Shabbat. And so the particular Chabad that I wanted to go to, it is actually inside of a bigger building. It's a room inside of a bigger building that is actually... Um, a bigger shul that is, uh, I guess what you would call mainstream orthodoxy slash modern yeshivish. So, I get to the front of the building and um, there's a security guard there. There's two security guards there. And he's a Russian speaking I don't know if he was Jewish, maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. And he says, Which means you don't have the green pass, and you can't come in. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, Chabad's in there. Then we ask, but we're trying to go to Chabad. And the guy goes, oh, 50 meters that way. What's 50 meters that way? 50 meters that way is a building, a residential building with some stores on the first floor. And I guess the owner was nice enough to let Chabad use what I would call a glorified um, driveway, you know, for cars. Why well, I say glorified because it was just big. So basically you have a thing with like, there's a giant minion, like 30 people. There's a giant, but 30 people, 40 people outside. Very nice. That's the Chabad. And so, you know, we finish praying Mincha, the afternoon prayer. This is, this is before Kabbalah Shabbat. And then this Rav, this Rabbi, who I kind of know, I know of him. I met him a few times. And he's been in charge of the Chabad for a while. He goes, guys, I just want to say, uh, you know, thank you for coming. And, um, you know, like, welcome to Chabad. He spoke in English. He's like, welcome to Chabad. <laughs> of so-and-so. <laughs> and uh, it's nice to be able to, you know, have a minyan and this and that and the other. Mur Hashem. And he was very thankful, very grateful that at the very least he had this outdoor minyan. And I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking to myself, you know guys, of all the Chabads that I have been to in Israel, not one, not even one, has required either a green pass, or you know, even so much as yelled at people to go get, you know what. At the very least, or at most, they require people to wear masks. That's about it. But they never, ever, 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 ever denied anybody entry. 
if anything, they said to themselves, well, if this person is like this and this person is like, you know, this person has this, this person doesn't have it. You know what we're gonna do? We're gonna figure this out and we're gonna, we're gonna accommodate the people. We're going to have an outdoor minyan to accommodate the people, the people, whoever, whoever needs a minyan, whoever needs to be part of a minyan. My friends, this is Chabad. In America, I would just tell you guys, uh, there is a, so to speak, verbal campaign to go, to tell people to go get, you know what, but again, they never denied anybody, they never turned anybody away, they never said, you need a green, green this or green that. They never said, you know, if you're not like this, don't come. If you're this, you know, they never turn anybody away. And we're talking about indoors. And also they made provisions for outdoors. My friends, if you're wondering why that's the case, only with Chabad, because, again guys, I talk a lot about being a former Soviet citizen. I talk a lot about tyranny and freedom you know, and once governments take your freedom, freedoms away, they're never going to give them back. I talk a lot about seeing the signs of these things. My friends, if you know anything about the history of Chabad, you know, I didn't need to live in Crown Heights for two and a half years to know the history, okay? You could go and you could read. You know, they have their own, so to speak, holidays. What, what is every, every Chabad commemoration day or every Chabad holiday about? It's about how one of their Rebbes defied the tyrannical authorities in Russia and they wanted, they wanted people, Jews, to not practice this and practice that and do this and do that. And these Rebbes did it either in the face of this tyranny, defi openly defying, or they did it clandestinely. More recently, the people who were either in former Soviet Union either moved to places like places like Samarkand in Uzbekistan and other places where they could they could practice more freely or if they if they didn't move they stayed in places like Moscow places like I think it was uh, Kiev, Riga, Latvia, <clears throat> Dnepropetrovsk and other places again guys you could read about the history and they basically set up underground what was basically underground Judaism, underground, you know, practice of Jewish tradition. Whether it was mikvahs, uh, chuppahs, um, you know, uh, brit milah, circumcision, kosher food, you know, shoichet, shechting, my friends, you name it, okay? What well, the three things that the Rebbe used to say? He used to say, most important thing, like say in a marriage, was kosher, shabbat, and taharat, mishpacha. So these guys decided, we're going to do shechting, uh, help people kind of educate them about shabbat, if they want, and family purity. We're going to build mikvahs. My friends, if you want to see, again, I always talk about this concept, bata b'shishim, 160th. Right now we're experiencing... Basically, one sixtieth of what was experienced, maybe in the Soviet Union and other places. If you want to see one sixtieth of what was going on with Lubavitchers in Russia, what they were doing, go to your local Chabad, whether it's in the States, but especially in Israel. Go to your local Chabad in Israel and see how they operate. And I'll tell you guys, in case you guys are wondering. You know, you guys can, can run around and tell me, oh, you know, what about all those old Dubavitchers that passed away in Crown Heights and this and that and the other. My friends, this was the beginning of the pandemic. We had no natural immunity. These people were all, were all older. If you know anything about uh, the way that things were run in New York with the hospitals and all these kind of things and reporting, it's safe to say that a lot of these people, you know, first of all, they had comorbidities. Second of all, a lot of these people may or may not have passed away from COVID. We don't know. On top of that, I have, you know, I spoke to some other people and, you know, they, they gave a more esoteric side of things. They said that, you know, much like in the desert, you know, we're getting close to Mashiach, so there was a generation of the tzaddikim that had to leave us, okay? But with that said, my friends, you know,
if you want to know what it was like, you want to see what's called 1 60th of what it was like, come to your local Chabad, especially if you're in Israel, and see how these guys, you know, they're, they're not here, they're here to serve you, meaning they are here to make sure that they figure out within reason, you know, working, so to speak, with even with the lockdowns and with the system and with the, uh, you know, restrictions, how to, to try to figure out how can we still make sure that a Jew participates in a minyan safely. How can a Jew participate in a minyan? How can a Jew do the mitzvah of sitting in the sukkah and mitzvah, mitzvah of the lulav? and a trog. How can a Jew not be alone during the Chagim? How can a Jew, how can we enable a Jew to come for Shabbat, uh, at least to the Minyan? My friends, this is Lubavitch. Guys, I, I grew up totally secular, traditional. I grew up going to Chabad on holidays. I will tell you, I will tell you, you know, if I had respect for Chabad before, guys, you could say whatever you want about Chabad. You could say this, uh, philosophy, Ashkafa, this and that, and Mashiach, all these things. I have a new and elevated, newfound and elevated respect for Chabad, my friends. Especially here in Israel. Again, it could be they're not, all the, they're not all the same. It could be some of them are like, oh, we're not going to let you in unless you have this, unless you have that. But I, I'm telling you guys, the experience so far, what I've experienced. Only positive things. Only positive things. You know? Only, only the, the goal has been to enable Jews to perform the mitzvot. Within safety, within reason. And, um, you know, again, these people's predecessors, these people's ancestors, even some, even parents who were in Russia or grandparents understood so firsthand what it's like to live under a government that wants nothing more than to control you. Not only that, in Israel, we understand that there's a government that wants to blame religious people and they want to restrict religious people. Guys, I'm telling you this because during the first lockdown, during the first set of restrictions, last year, I was here in Jerusalem and people were screaming and yelling about the Haredim, the Haredim, and then they're this and then they're that. My friends, and then I went to and then I went to Tel Aviv. At the same time as people were yelling at the Haredim, I went to Tel Aviv, and the bars were packed, and the cafes were packed, and nobody was wearing a mask, and cops didn't give a damn. Cops didn't talk to anybody and didn't stop anybody. They only stopped people in Jerusalem on the streets, individuals with nobody next to them. My friends, you want to say that no Haredim were not targeted? My friends, religious people, especially Haridim, were targeted. It's a straight up, we understand that. It's, it's not a conspiracy theory. They were targeted. Okay, again, I was here, I live here in Jerusalem. I saw what I saw here, and then I went to Tel Aviv at the same time, and I saw what I saw over there, and everybody was blaming the Haridim. Nothing, you know, cops didn't care about, about anything in Tel Aviv. So my friends, we understand that the government is targeting or was I don't know what they're doing now now they're having another discussion in the so to speak discussion which I think is a dog, dog and pony show and again they're saying we know how the Haredim are we know this we know that and we cannot make an exemption lockdown exemption for the synagogues for the shuls my friends I will just tell you this is just my, my hunch, my prediction. No matter what happens, no matter what the government does, I think Chabad will have minyanim. Chabad will have minyanim. It'll, it'll have them outside. 
they will not not have a minyan. If they can get 10 men together, if Chabad can, has a way, has, knows that 10 men will show up, they can, you know, in a WhatsApp group, they'll say, guys, we're going to have an outdoor minyan. We're going to have a minyan, I don't know, on the moon, on a rooftop somewhere, on a, I don't know. I don't know, somebody's house, whatever, underground. We'll make sure, okay, you guys are, you know, okay, please get tested. Go get tested the day before. Go pay 100 shekels over here. Or I don't know, there's free, you know, they're going to have them at the gas stations now. Free testing, or okay, pay 100 shekels. Whether it's the fast one, the PCR one, go get tested. It's the holidays, come on, let's be responsible. Or, you know, show us that, you, okay, either you're vaxxed, or that you recovered, or you, you're tested. Okay, get 10 guys together. My friends, I'm telling you, this is Chabad. We don't leave a man behind. This is, this is like the Marines, you know, special forces, my friends. That's how they roll. And my friends, and you know, you could say whatever you want. You could say this, you could say that, Haredim, whatever it is. It's only because they understood what tyrannical governments did at that time. And that was just an, a direct attack on religion at that time. Because if you have Hashem and you have the Torah, you don't need tyrants. You don't need, you know, Stalin. You don't need a, a czar. You have Hashem, you have the Torah. Yeah, listen, my friends. This guy's saying they hate faith more than anything. Guys, if you want to see foreshadowing for what's going to happen in the rest of the Western world with this thing, in terms of the policies, look, look today at Israel, and then you'll see what's going to be in about four or five or six months everywhere else. And as goes Israel, so goes the world, my friends. And so the way that Israel's treating religious people and blaming and singling out Meanwhile, again, guys, I mean, you can call me this and call me that. I was in Tel Aviv during that lockdown last year. People were in cafes. People were in bars. The cops didn't care. And the cops didn't find anybody. I asked my friends, the cops finding you? They're like, nope. The cops don't care here. Welcome to Tel Aviv. Party, party, party. Beach, beach, beach. And you come to Jerusalem on the same day. You take a bus, the 480 bus. Arrive in Jerusalem. Everybody's walking. It looks like dystopia. Everyone walking around in a mask. The Haredim are vilified, turned into pariahs of society. My friends. So, these Lubavitchers, they understood what it was like then. They were told stories. Every year they forbring, they get together and they forbring about this Rebbe and that Rebbe, how this one went to prison, this one was wrongfully accused, this one, you know, went to prison for a couple of weeks, was released. This one wrote the Tanya in prison. The first Rebbe, Shner Zaman of the Adi. Okay? My friends, this is literally, we're living in the same times. This is literally no different. The only thing is, I would say, this is basically what we call Bata Bishishim, 160th. Just to give us a taste, because my friends, you know, we know that we're before Mashiach, and we know that these, the, the reincarnation of all of these forces. Have to, has to come back, but it's come, it came back, you know, I would say, relatively speaking, with less intensity. You know, all of these evil entities, all of these evil people, but it's, you know, these are, these are just Gilgulim of the, you know, the era of Rav, Ishmael, whatever you want to call it. That's it, guys, but Again, if I had already a respect for these guys, I have a really, I have a newfound respect for them. Now I understand what, you know, my family comes from Berdichev, a place called Berdichev, my parents, my, my father's family. Now I understand what my, people like my great-grandfather, or even my grandfather, I know his stories of what he was doing went through in this face of tyrannical governments and now I understand that you know as the Rebbe told Bibi back when Bibi back when Bibi was Bibi he told him you know a little bit of light 
can dispel the darkness. In a room full of darkness, a little bit of light, one candle can dispel the darkness, my friends. And you know what? As far as the Minyanim are concerned, my friends, the show must go on. And it will go on. Responsibly. But it will go on. It will go on. And I just want to thank Chabad for making this happen, for making it possible. And uh, listen, guys, you know, for all you other, guys, all the, so to speak, Orthodox groups, I will just tell you whatever you have, whatever dispute you have with Chabad, whatever issues you have with Chabad, if I were you, I would take an example. I would take an example, because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, this whole game is all about a munah. It's all about a munah and Hashem. You're either with Hashem or you're not. It's really it. Or you're bound down to some, you know, magical liquid that you think is so magical. That somebody told you is so magical that apparently the third time somebody took it already, people still, it didn't work. They still got, had problems. I don't know guys, it's really up to you, it's really up to you, this thing is from Hashem, and you know, as they say, Hashem gives you the medicine before He gives you the disease, so, you either want to be with Hashem or you don't, that's really what it comes down to, and, but yeah, I, I really, I now understand what these people went through, I understand where we are, I understand the lens of how they're looking at things, and it's absolutely correct. And that's basically it, guys. All right. I shall talk to you soon. Hodesh Tov again. It's the second day of Rosh Hodesh. Our cousins are still making noise. Baruch Hashem. I'll talk about our cousins next time. In a positive sense. You'll see what I mean. All right, guys. Hodesh Tov.